It was August of 2017 when Ava suggested we take a break from our hard work and take a road trip to the southwest. I began planning right away with routes and destinations, food supplies and equipment. After months of preparation, we began packing on October 28th. The bins worked well, but it took several attempts to eventually get the right sequence. We were to begin our journey on October 30th. This was the first 320 miles of a 10,000 mile road trip, and we were headed to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This rooftop tent was our new home for the next six weeks. We had all the essentials for making this our base camp, and we fired up the stove for some celebratory tea and our lucky Norwegian gook open. Here's to good adventures and safe travels. We visited the battlefield. It's difficult to imagine the death and chaos that once tore apart this landscape. If any souls remain bound to the land, their eternity stands in great contrast to the last moments. May they now rest in peace. We drove for four hours from Gettysburg to Shenandoah National Park. We made it to Shenandoah National Park, and the forests of the east are so inviting. We hiked the ridgeline along the Mount Marshall Wilderness Area to an escarpment overlooking the Shenandoah Valley and Hogback Mountain. Time here moves more slowly as the exposed rocks are remnants of the Grandfather Mountains of the Appalachians. They're over one billion years old. We spent the rest of the day driving to Big Meadows Campground and slept cold that night as the temperatures dropped into the 20s. Three and another 250 miles of driving. This was a great drive through the mountains and valleys on the way to the New River Gorge. We made it to Little Beaver Campground and had to stretch our legs for a hike. The park was exceptionally quiet and the woods gave way to thick rhododendron forests. It was then off to Grand View, along the western rim of the New River Gorge. Here, the canyon is 1,500 feet deep, and the North Flowing River is said to be one of the oldest on the planet.
we left the New River Gorge and drove 360 miles to Mammoth Cave National Park. The drive was scenic with lots of mountains on the way to Kentucky. After arriving, we planned the next day by lantern light, fell asleep, and suddenly it was morning. With over 400 miles of passages, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave system on the planet. After resetting my GoPro for low light, we explored the fissures and tunnels leading to frozen Niagara. Nobody looks too concerned that those giant slabs used to be part of the ceiling. This is frozen Niagara. We explored only a half mile over a two and a half hour duration. At that rate, it would take about a year to see it all. Once we made it back to camp, I opted for a side adventure. I know, Mammoth Cave isn't known for its mountain biking, but after learning about the trails, I had to give it a shot. It was a pleasant ride through hardwoods in autumn. The trail was smooth and flowy, and great for a quick rip before sundown. We were in Nashville for an afternoon stroll. The city was booming with tourists, and the competing amplified music added turbulence to the atmosphere. It was the weekend prior to the Country Music Awards, and the party already started. We escaped the cacophony of country music and explored the parks and architecture of the city. The City Walk of Fame was quite a spot in town and a perfect spot to take a break. While in Nashville, the little lady needs to get herself some cowgirl boots. At 450 miles, driving from Nashville to Crater of Diamond State Park in southwestern Arkansas was so far our longest drive. Here we are at the park and ready to dig for our own diamonds. This is where Ava found a million dollar diamond. But that was just her imagination. Instead of diamonds, we found a lot of hard work, endless volcanic soil, and useless pebbles. The process involves dry sifting pebbles from the soil. Theoretically speaking, diamonds are then found in a pile of remaining stones. Once the 
buckets were filled with stones, it was off to the wash stations for wet sifting. The process to find diamonds in the wash is a tricky process and one that, for us, only yielded a handful of quartz. Arkansas sun. I dragged my tired ass back to the campground, wondering why in the world we did this. But earlier in the year, a 14-year-old kid found a 7.5 carat diamond. It was 360 miles of driving through a decidedly different landscape. The train became flat and there were far fewer trees. It was cold in Oklahoma, and we had Red Rock Canyon to ourselves. The California Road Nature Trail follows part of the historic wagon train trail that westward settlers used in the mid-1800s. If you keep your eyes peeled, you can see wagon ruts left in the stone from thousands of wagons passing through here. got to see our first cactus of the trip. The settlers used Red Rock Canyon as an extended stay camp to escape the wind-ravaged terrain above the rim. Now it's a campground for tourists. But considering the canyon was used for camps by Native Americans, this campground was nearly continually used for hundreds if not thousands of years. Though Red Rock Canyon was an enjoyable novelty along our journey, it represented just a small taste of the exotic rock formations yet to come. It was a five hour drive from Red Rock Canyon to Palo Duro Canyon in Texas. The landscape became incredibly flat, and some of the roads were laser straight for miles and miles. After driving south of Amarillo, we made it to the canyon by the early afternoon. We set up camp in one of the best spots on the entire trip. Ava wanted to relax and I opted for an evening bike ride. This was my first ride through a canyon and this is no doubt the American Southwest. I 
I was riding ribbons of trail on the canyon floor, with towering walls of rugged rock lurking along its edges. Dry riverbeds led to great red walls of rock. The bright sun splits the air from above, causing shadows to dance and chasing away the chill of the evening. The ghosts of Comanche, Apache, and Kiowa rode with me through the canyon they once called home for the last 12,000 years. The next day we set off for our hike around mid-morning, with temps pushing into the upper 30s. itself is 10 miles wide and over 100 miles long. It's filled with cliff-faced mesas, caves, strange rock pinnacles, and hoodoos. The floor is profuse with prickly pear cactuses, sand sage, mesquite, and cottonwood, all vegetation I've seen for the first time. was an amazing experience for a couple of New Englanders. We finally reached the legendary exotic landscapes of the Southwest. We left Palo Duro Canyon and drove 300 miles to the beautiful city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. The sun was shining for the whole ride, which made the trip that much better. We stayed at the Santa Fe Motel and Inn, which was a budget deal like a motel, but with accommodations of a nice inn. We explored Cathedral Park and the historic Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis. This is the famous San Miguel Mission, built in the early 1600s. It's the oldest standing church in the United States. It was built by adobe by Native Americans, then eventually stucco to preserve it. The city's aesthetic is utterly unique compared to cities of the Northeast.
Vibrant colors were everywhere. The arts permeate the city and there's sculptures everywhere. After eating dinner, I got very tired, and it was time to call it a night. We drove south through 270 miles of desert from Santa Fe to White Sands National Monument. We camped at Oliver Lee Memorial State Park, perched along the dry flank of the Sacramento Mountains. We set up camp by late morning, and that gave us some time to relax. This is the Chihuahuan Desert. The landscape was completely exotic with plants like the yucca, prickly pear cactus, and chola. It was then off to White Sands National Monument. This is one of the world's most unique environments. The sand is made from eroded mountain gypsum, and these dunes cover more than 175,000 acres. That's four times the size of Cape Cod National Seashore. The sand has some strange properties, as it's both the wettest and coldest sand on Earth. The bright white sand reflects solar radiation, and it doesn't heat up during the day. This is one reason snakes completely avoid the dunes. The dunes retain an enormous amount of water and this creates a solid crust that freezes the dunes in place. We then tackled the Alkali Flat Trail, which certainly isn't flat and shouldn't be taken lightly. It was just a five mile loop through the dunes, but we heard it can be harder than it looks so we brought extra food and water. For the first half mile, the sand was churned up, which sapped our momentum. But Boondosh was very excited to be hiking in this new strange snow. This place is amazing. The desert is clamped by the Sacramento Mountains to the east and the San Andres Mountains to the west. In the middle, contrasted by a blue sky, lies an enormous sea of white sand. Though the sand is cool, the sun gets tremendously powerful with rays striking from both above and below. The temps were only in the mid 70s, but it was feeling pretty hot. This makes the white sand desert particularly dangerous during the summer months. Boondosh needed a break. I pulled out my folding shovel and dug a cooling hole for her to recover. With her to my shadow, fully hydrated, and in that cold hole, she bounced right back. Hiking up sand dunes is challenging stuff. With each step forward, your boots post hole into the loose sand only to slide a half step back. My quads were burning with this one and my heart began pounding in my ears. By the time I reached the top, I was whooped.
now Ava's turn to struggle to the top of the dune. She did pretty well though, considering the difficulty. After a short breather, we continued along our way. Being in the middle of the desert is a strange feeling. On one hand, the beauty of the stark emptiness is inspiring. And on the other hand, it's an empty space devoid of help. In the event of a sandstorm or the heat of the summer, it could be deadly. This five mile trail felt more like 10, but it's well worth the effort and a great experience. While still in Alamogordo, Ava decided to tour the International Space Hall of Fame. And I chose to punish myself physically. We drove way up into the Sacramento Mountains and at 9,000 feet in elevation, I hopped onto the rim trail. This is the Lincoln National Forest. It's strange to think just 4,500 feet below is the Chihuahuan Desert, but here, it's a heavily forested mountain environment resulting from the orographic effect. The trail is pretty straightforward with long, gentle slopes and devoid of any true technical features, but the scenic vistas are what draws people here. It was late in the day, and I only had time to ride 5 miles of the 30 mile rim trail. This is known as the most scenic multi-use trail in the area, and I definitely had to ride it. It was 350 miles of driving to Sombrero National Park in Arizona. We drove over the bone dry San Andres Mountains. This was 
was our most immersive trek through deep desert terrain as we drove through the heart of the Chihuahuan Desert, through Cochise Stronghold, and into the edge of the Sonoran Desert. We arrived at Seguero National Park late in the evening. This gave us just enough time to tour Cactus Forest Drive, a paved auto road loop that explores the heart of the park. The desert garden grows between 3 and 4 thousand feet in elevation, clamped between mountains and canyons. The higher elevation and the increased moisture that comes with it creates the perfect habitat for a desert jungle. This is my favorite cactus, the jumping chola. Of course the giant sogueros were impressive as well. were dry as a bone, but the thick vegetation was surprisingly green and lush. There are at least two dozen different types of cactuses that grow here and another 300 other types of plants. This makes off-trail trekking nearly impossible. Lots of animals live here as well, including the mule deer, white-tailed deer, bobcat, jackrabbit, gray fox, coyote, and mountain lion. More specialized animals include the cody, ringtail, colored peccary, gila monster, and desert tortoise. There are also seven types of poisonous snakes that reside here. It would have been nice to spend more time here, but we'll have to save more rigorous adventures for next time.
Tucson area and drove 300 miles deep into the Superstition Mountains. Our goal was to visit three of the famous ancient dwellings along the way. Our first stop was Casa Grande National Monument. The ruins that stand today represent just a small portion of the original complex. Originally four stories tall and occupying a much larger footprint, it was the largest structure of its kind in North America. It was built 700 years ago from adobe. Since then, rain erosion has slowly degraded it. But now a metal canopy and special chemical treatment keep it safe. After driving to Tonto National Monument, we began climbing the hardened trail to the top. A natural desert garden complete with saguaro cactuses hugged the flank of the mountain. The natives farmed the river valley below then returned to their mountain respite to enjoy cooler temperatures and overlook their fields. They did this in weekly shifts with a rotation of people working and resting. dwelling is now in ruins. It originally had cooking hearths, large cistern for water, and two dozen separate rooms. The view from the cliff is absolutely amazing, and the natives that built this must have appreciated the aesthetics as well. It was then off to the northern part of the mountains. This is Montezuma Castle National Monument. Unlike Tonto, this cliff dwelling is remarkably well preserved. It held about four dozen people about 800 years ago. This is beautiful Sedona, Arizona, and the red rock cliffs are what truly put the town on the map. A church surrounded by a cathedral of rock, Chapel of the Holy Cross is world-renowned as an architectural masterpiece. Eva 
explored the downtown area which had echoes of Santa Fe with sculptures and art galleries. As Ava explored Sedona, I broke way for some mountain biking. This is the famous Chuck Wagon Trail. Designed as a fun flow trail for intermediate riders, the real draw are the scenic vistas. Even the streams are dry enough to take trail. Aged and splintered bedrock bakes in the unforgiving sun. My shin guards barely took the abuse as cactuses deflect. Prickly, sharp, and toothy plants lay wait for wide turns and drifting tires. Snakes hide in the brush, and gnarly trees breathe the parched air. Giant red blocks of rock rest on the horizon. Sedona is a great place to ride and I hope to return someday. It was 114 miles from Sedona to the Grand Canyon, but this was not our original plan. We had originally planned on camping at a Bureau of Land Management site, about 30 minutes north of Sedona. But not only was that campground shuttered for the season, they all were. Our only choice was to push through to the Grand Canyon and book a night at their lodge since we'd be getting there so late. The next morning the temperature fell into the 40s, but that didn't matter. We actually made it to the Grand Canyon. What a magnificent erosion in the Earth's crust. Geologists estimate the canyon to be 17 million years old and expose a geologic history as far back as 2.5 billion. The canyon is almost 300 miles long and because of its exceptionally rugged terrain, only 12 people have ever through hiked its entire length. Meanwhile, 300 times more people have climbed to the top of Mount Everest.
The depth and width of the canyon are almost unfathomable. The distance to the far rim across the canyon is 10 to 12 miles. You would need to string together 14 of the largest single span bridges in the world just to get to the other side. And the river on the canyon floor is over 6,000 feet down. If you stack two of the tallest buildings in the world, you're still 1,000 feet too short. And as magnificent as the Grand Canyon is, it's still just the sixth largest canyon in the world. These are some of Ava's best photos of the canyon. This is the famous Desert View Watchtower, which was built to reflect the design elements of ancient dwellings. We drove 150 miles through the Painted Desert from the Grand Canyon to Page, Arizona. After crossing a 700 foot high bridge straddling the canyon, we found a massive dam holding back 20 cubic miles of water. Our next stop was a short hike along the Hanging Garden Trail. There was no soil anywhere, just rock and sand. About a half mile up the mesa we found the Hanging Garden. The views from the top were absolutely amazing. The water below is Lake Powell within Glen Canyon. The next day we explored Antelope Slot Canyon. Thousands of years of flash flooding have created the maze and corkscrew sculptures in Navajo sandstone. It was one of the most beautiful places we've ever seen.
we drove 270 miles north through the Pana Desert into the canyon lands of Utah. It was a cold snap, so we chose to stay in an old motel in town. Moab is home to megalithic stone arches, towers, mesas, canyons, and slick rock. It's an otherworldly place almost as unique as White Sands. Moab is also a world famous mountain biking destination with the Slick Rock Trail as its most celebrated. I rented a high-end bike and hit the trails. The rogue waves of petrified sand dunes, now turned to slick rock, are frozen in time creating an alien world that invites mountain bikes to play. I was lucky enough to ride here in the off season and I almost had the place to myself. Rolling ridge lines with plummeting sides gives the impression of exposure. This martial landscape is perfect for rolling with momentum. Put in 14 miles of classic slick rock that morning. Meanwhile, Abel took Boondosh to hike Grand Staff Trail. It's a beautiful canyon that was originally owned by an African American, William Grand Staff, around 1880. His land is now one of the most popular hikes in Utah. After hours of hiking, they finally reached the Morning Glory Natural Bridge. With a span of 243 feet and a height of 75, it's one of the largest of its kind in North America. By the time Ava returned from her hike, I had already recovered from my morning ride and was preparing for my second. 
I began my ride from Spring Canyon, and I was heading up to the top of Amasa Mesa. The entire area has deep plunging cliffs carved out by the forces of water. Cane Creek on this side and the Colorado River on the other create an island of rock. The spectacular beauty and technical riding train makes this one of the best rides in Moab. The Haimasa Trail follows Spring Canyon to a draw that leads to the plateau high on Amasa Mesa. After riding to the western rim, I hit the famous Captain Ahab Trail. The canyon lurked below like a monster. Then the traditional single track arose to a narrow goat trail requiring animalistic disregard of consequence. The monuments and cathedrals of the canyon made for such a rich visual experience, the trail can only be described as a masterpiece. After riding 23 miles along two classic Moab routes, I was completely spent. We drove a thousand miles on a wild goose chase. On the first day we drove to visit friends in Fort Collins, Colorado. Then we set out for Sheridan, Wyoming on our way to Snowshoe at Glacier National Park. But that night in Sheridan we found out there were terrible conditions there and enormously high avalanche risk. So we reversed course to visit friends and explore the Black Hills of South Dakota. Our long journey began with a drive through Arches National Park.
approach the infamous Eisenhower Tunnel at 11,158 feet in elevation, our little Honda CRV struggled mightily to gasp enough oxygen to keep going. At one point, I thought we were going to stall, but the little Honda kept trucking and through the tunnel we went. Wyoming was the land of grass and high winds. Finally, as we reached the Black Hills, ponderosa pines blanketed the landscape. Our first excursion was at the beautiful Sylvan Lake. At over 6,000 feet in elevation, it was bone cold up there, but we needed some exercise after that long three-day drive. The main characteristic of the Black Hills are the granite outcroppings, towers, and spires. It was good to be back in the Black Hills. This is where Abe and I met and got married back in 2000. The next day we met with Mary, one of our longtime friends, and we set out to hike to the top of Black Elk Peak. The forest is now in recovery from a severe blight that hit around 2005. Large sections of forest had died, leaving just the oldest trees and youngest saplings alive. At the halfway point, we were already well above most mountains. Meanwhile, Boondosh and her new hiking buddy Aloysius kept an eye out for dangerous mountain lions and especially chipmunks. At 7,200 feet, Black Elk Peak is the highest mountain in the Black Hills. It's also the center of an ancient uplift that created the small mountainous island in the middle of the prairie. The mountain is named for the famous Lakota Sioux Black Elk that had a vision right here. The tower was built by the CCC back in 1938 as a plaque commemorating Valentin McGillicuddy's humanitarian efforts with the Lakotas. He was bestowed the name Wasiku Wonkong, or Holy White Man. We approach cathedral spires, a granite enclave related to the nearby needles. There's something special about this place. The stone sanctuary was designated a national natural landmark back in the mid 1970s. called Hanson Larson Memorial Park 
The ride begins in Founders Park and climbs a sparsely forested mountain overlooking town. This trail is named Wild Turkey and it runs down the ridge like a drunken fowl. It was a bit much for my rigid fat bike. Had I brought my full suspension bike, I could have just ripped. I am at the top of Sunrise Loop. The remainder of the ride was a lot more mild-mannered than Wild Turkey. The trails were machine-built by both the International Mountain Bicycling Association and Progressive Designs. Though not a masterpiece, the ride is fast, flowy, and fun. Geared more toward cardio than adrenaline, the ride really flushes your system. I had a good time here, but I have to get back to begin our return trip. We drove from Rapid City through the Badlands and deep into the sand hills of Nebraska. Then we drove around Kansas City and then on to St. Louis, Missouri. We stopped to see family in Pennsylvania, then drove back to Deep River, Connecticut. All told, it was 2,000 miles home. Just east of Kansas City, I needed to stretch my legs, so I rode the trails of William Landall Park Reserve as Ava took Boondosh for a hike. I took the Argo Trail to the Trail of Tasty Goodness for a short five mile ride. It was a shame because there were almost 20 miles of trails here and one technical challenge I missed called Rim Jog. Even the Tasty Goodness Trail was surprisingly technical in spots. I didn't know Missouri had rocks.
was a good ride that quickly wrapped up my fun, and then we hit the road. We traversed Missouri and headed to St. Louis to tour Gateway Arch. At over 600 feet, this is the tallest man-made monument in the Americas, and the highest arch on the planet. Its size is so overwhelming that you'd swear it's 1,500 feet high. Ava went inside and took a rickety elevator to the top to get a bird's eye view. Lewis was our last monumental destination as we continued along the highways of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. Back to all the places we've been, it hardly seems real. But the trip wasn't about bagging destinations as much as it was about the freedom to explore and the need for discovery. This month gave our souls a much needed rest from the toxic stress of life. And as we drove the last leg of the trip, we already began discussing our next adventure. <laughs> 